this is Bishra, product coach and consultant from Switzerland and Pure Dojo partner. Today I want to talk to you about the situation that many of you are facing right now. And it's actually a situation that's happening all over the year. Right now it hits you probably harder than ever before. It's a situation that you are facing massive changes in the workflow in your company and now have to deal with the consequences. The consequences are workflows that are not working very well. And even if they are working very well, there's probably still a lot of space for improvement. Maybe your situation is that you are working with reduced time now and maybe spend two out of four hours a day in calls and feel like you're not productive anymore. Maybe you have to deal with twice the demand than like double the demand than, than before, but you have only the same resources as before. So how should you, or how can you be able to, to manage that? Maybe actually everything is the same. It's just that everybody's remote right now. And um, well, yeah, the workflows are different and some things need to be improved. Or maybe there is something completely different and it's a completely different reason why things are not working well for you. So how can you make changes? By naming the issues, by, by bringing them up. But what if you want to bring them up but fear consequences? What if you think you don't want to be pointed out as the troublemaker in the company? Or maybe you are even new to the company and don't want to be pointed out as a troublemaker right from the beginning. Or maybe um, you think that you're the only one who has this problem and don't want to make it bigger than it is. Maybe you have actually talked with a couple of colleagues with, you know, like about your ideas and, and talked about some improvements, but they never made it through to your team. Or maybe other teams don't want to make improvement and they don't talk about things that are happening. But maybe we're actually not talking about you who is afraid of um, you know, naming the things and talking about the things that are not working. Maybe it's your colleagues, maybe it's your teammates who you know, have the feeling that they want to do uh, or they want to be open and, and speak about the things that are happening, but can't for whatever reason. Or maybe it's even your manager who wants to talk about things that don't work, but is too, yeah, too unexperienced, um, you know, hasn't enough experience to, to, to handle this kind of situations. It can be any reason why things are not working and why people are not talking about it. But if you want to make improvements, you need to talk about it. The magic word is continuous improvements. Now, continuous improvements is not a new concept. It's not a fancy thing that those agile hipsters have, um, you know, created or, or um, came up with. It's actually a concept known from the manufacturing industry since like 1950s. And if you don't believe me, you can look it up on the internet. You can look up continuous improvement. You can look up Kaizen, Deming, and other kind of, of tools and, and frameworks that the manufacturing industry is using. So we're not in the manufacturing industry probably. I'm a digital product management consultant, so I'm, I'm more on the digital space. However, many concepts from the manufacturing industries made it up to our industry. And one of that is continuous improvement. So what's the easiest way to start with continuous improvements in your team and me maybe even in your whole company. The easiest thing, a very quick and easy way to set up continuous improvement processes, to learn from things that happened and, and improve them, a very, very easy way to really start right away with, without any, or not, let's say not big changes and not big um, preparations and that gives you immediate results and imme immediate impact is retrospectives. I'm a huge fan of retrospectives. So whatever you do, whatever you don't do, 
do retrospectives. Yes, retrospectives is a ceremony, a scrum ceremony. Um, but no, you don't have to be working with Scrum to run retrospectives. You don't need to like Scrum even. You can even have ditched the whole Scrum thing, you know, you and your team might have figured out that you don't like working with Scrum. That's okay. That's fine, really. Like ditch ditch all the ceremonies as if 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 you and your team wants that, do that. That's fine. But keep the retrospectives. Seriously, keep the retrospectives. You might actually not even have to be working in an agile environment. You don't even have to know anything about, about agile at all to run retrospectives. You don't even need to be in a product or engineering team to run retrospectives. You can be in any even classic department, classic industries. Your company can be a completely classic com company, you know. You can be in legal, in finance, in, in marketing, in, in HR, in whichever department you are, you can run retrospectives today. Okay, maybe not today, but tomorrow, let's say, and start with your continuous improvement process right away. So what are retrospectives actually? I'm saying retrospectives all the time. Many of you know what ret retrospectives are, but maybe there's like, some people who don't know it, practically speaking, the retrospective is a time that you set aside, like outside of your daily work, for your team, with your team, to reflect on the work happened that happened in the last iteration. Reflect on that to learn from it. When I say last iteration, it can be anything. Right. It can be a couple of weeks. It can be the last project. It can be um, the last release cycle. Um, I will say something about that later. Um, but in general, let's let's leave it as it is. Yeah. The retrospective um, is not the place to finger point to people and play the blame game. No, it's not the place to get personal, get on a mean personal level. No. The retrospective is the place where you should talk about work, about workflows that need to be improved, not people who need to be improved. And that's a very, very important job of the facilitator to make sure that people really talk about work and not about, you know, not trying to, to blame others for things that didn't go well. All right, so how would you run a retrospective? So if you're a Scrum Master or an Agile coach, I'm sure you know a million different ways how to run a good retrospective. But if you're not, how do you run that? So if you are like me um, and you had to run retrospectives in, in any kind of job that, you've, that you had that, um, in your career, Okay, there was one uh, place where I didn't have to run the retrospectives. But um, if you're like me and you have to do that because you don't have a Scrum Master or an Agile coach, or maybe you are the Scrum Master and Agile coach anyway, um, you don't have the time to prepare a very well retrospective, a very well thought through retrospective. The best Agile coach that I have met in my career really he sat down and thought it through he thought about every single piece of the retrospective that needed to match so that he would be able to run um, the retrospective on a topic that he thinks we as a team should be talking about and improve on based on his observation observations of the last um, iteration but you as a product manager if you have to run the retrospective you don't have that time you have enough things to do i know that but you should still run it. And there is easy ways to do it. First of all, how do you actually run it? So if you don't know yet how to run it, um, there's five stages of a retrospective. The first stage is setting the stage. So this is the stage um, or the phase where you have to make sure that the team feels safe enough 
to really open up and engage, to really participate actively in the retrospective. Yes, we're speaking about trust, we're speaking about psychological safety, we're speaking about people who, like your team members, who need to feel that they can be themselves, they can talk about their thoughts without fearing any punishment. And that's your job to make sure that they feel this way. Um, that's also the stage where you set the topic. So typically you look at the work in the last iteration, but you can also really put a topic out there and say like, yeah, this is something that we really need to talk about. Um, so let's talk about this, whatever it is, something obviously that is really obviously not working very well. Um, so again, if you're not in an agile environment, you might say, okay, let's have a look at how the last project went or the last release and your release cycles are, I don't know, three months maybe. I really recommend you not to do that. I really recommend you, especially right now, to start with two weeks, to look at the last two weeks, how you work together in the last two weeks and take it from there. If the team thinks two weeks are too much and um, you know, actually every four weeks would be enough, then that's fine. It's the team's decision. If the team feels like um, two, week is, two weeks is not enough and you should be looking at the last week, then also fine. You have to adapt the length of the retrospective to the weeks that you're looking at. So if you start with two weeks, start with 90 minutes for the retrospective, Again, take it from there. You will see if that works or not, and you can adjust it then afterwards. So setting the stage, make sure your team feels safe and make sure the topic is set. And if the topic is just look at the work from the last uh, cycle or the last um, X weeks, then it's that. Then the second stage is gathering data. So now there's different frameworks on how you can run a retrospective. Um, one easy way to do um, is uh, asking the questions, what went well and what can be improved? There's other ones, uh, start, stop, continue, change, speedboat. There's like different ways of how you can actually gather data. This is simply the stage where people are asked to share their thoughts on that topic. So, Everybody has a different view on the same thing, and therefore it's important that everybody contributes. However, again, psychological safety. If people don't feel safe enough to open up, then they won't. And then you should not try to force them to open up. That will do exactly the opposite. That will show them that they cannot speak up, and they will definitely not participate if you try to force them. So one tip um, from practice that I can give you is um, have an ally. Um, so before you start running the retrospectives, have your ally um, in the team who wants to make it work together with you and who will participate um, actively in the retrospective and show the others, you know, leading by example, show the others that it's okay to contribute and it's actually welcome to contribute and then it's of course your um uh it's 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 on you to be open to the input that your ally will give in in the retrospective and to show that you really want to hear that and you want to take actions based on that input so have an ally um and uh like when you start out with retrospectives have an ally um who will uh is, who is somebody that the team trusts and really wants to make changes and wants to run that with you. <clears throat> so, all right, so you, you, you're gathering data, you're gathering the thoughts, so you can, you can take post-its, um, like in a physical environment, you could take post-its um, and you know, ask people to write um, their input down and then collect it. In the virtual environment, there is either some retrospective tools that you can use or you can also use tools like, like whiteboarding tools like Miro or, or Mural. 
Then you get to the third stage, which is generate insights. So what you do now is um, you'll have a bunch of 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 take of, of uh, sorry of of cards of input, and um, many of them will be similar. Even even though people have different views on the same thing, the topics themselves will somehow be similar. Now you can cluster those topics um, and give them headlines, and then ask the team to vote on the headlines to vote on the clusters. That, um, that contain the topics that they want to talk about. Based on that, you will sort um, the, the headlines based on um, uh, vote count, and you will pick the most important one, two, or three um, topics that in the next stage you want to talk about with your team. Why only one, two, or three? Because in the next stage, you want to create action items to you know, make improvements. And the more action items you have, the more paralyzed can the team be. And the more topics you talk about, the more action items you will generate. And also you will, I, I, I doubt that you will have the time to talk about more than one to, um, like more than up to three topics. Um, if you do have time afterwards, it can be an indicator that the quality of the discussions were not deep enough, um, it was not deep enough. Um, yeah, so that's a trade-off that, you know, you have to decide if you want to make it or not. You know, number of topics that you want to talk about versus quality of the discussion that you go through. So I've mentioned the next stage, it's the stage four, decide what to do. So while you're talking about um, those topics, um, you will collect action items. So for each topic, you will collect different action items. Um, and again, don't have too many action items. That's gonna uh, uh, paralyze uh, your team. Um, and even if it doesn't paralyze your team, um, think about it. If you have to do your daily job and have like 10 action items um, that are assigned to you to help your team to improve, you know, there's again a quality trade off. So the action items that you will have uh, or that are assigned to you, um, either the quality will be bad, the quality of the things that you will, that you will um, try to do, um, the action items, or you simply won't be able to do all of all of them, right? So the more action items you have, um, the higher the chance that they won't get done or the quality will be poor. So therefore, once you've talked through the topics and um, collected action items, then you should be voting again on the action items together with the team to agree on the top action items in the team and then assign those ones to the team members, you know, so that you have some, some responsibility and accountability on, on, um, on implementing whatever you, you decided on in the team. So, and then finally, we get to the fifth stage, which is closing the retrospective. I'm hearing uh, many times from different um, agile coaches and I'm also reading it um, here and there that you should be sharing um, a complete um, yeah like positive feedback let's say uh, in your team like appreciations in your team for the things that have been done um, also on personal level like when somebody did an awesome job. Um, I hope that you're talking about or that you're giving appreciations um, actually uh, in your daily work. I hope that you will also have talked about appreciations um, uh, in, during your discussion. If not, yes, please do that. Please um, show your appreciation um, like in the team uh, at like latest in the stage. It's good. We should not only talk about things that don't work, you know, we should also um, celebrate the things that do work actually very well and also celebrate people who, who did like very, very good things. So yes, you can do that. 
In this stage, what you should definitely do is collecting feedback about the retrospective session. So a mini retro on the retro. So what went well, what didn't, what can be done better the next time. Um, and then, you know, you'll, you'll take that and really try to make it better, better the next time based on the feedback that you collect here. So again, it's those um, five steps, uh, set the stage, um, gather input or gather data, um, uh, get insights, uh, decide what to do and uh, close the retrospective. So um, again, so it kind of sounds easy, um, but again, it also takes a lot of time to prepare very well uh, retrospectives, the time that you don't have as a product manager, um, definitely not. Um, so if you want to use some tools that support you in that, um, I recommend, uh, there's two tools that I recommend. One is FunRetro.io and one is Parable SO, I think. Um, each of them have their advantages and disadvantages. Fun retro is very simple to use and it's really fun to do retro, um, but it doesn't support you in um, those ice breaking things and setting the stage and so on and so forth. Parable is more automated and supports you in that, uh, but it's also a bigger tool and you feel it when, when you use it that it's quite some, yeah, it's a, it's a heavier tool. Um, if you want to start out, you can really try Parable. Um, and then once you're into it, you can switch to Fun Retro, or you can really try Fun Retro um, right away and find your icebreakers and um, things like that uh, on the internet. Um, the point about the trust and psychological safety, however, is a different one. It's something that you cannot fix with tools. And that's basically the last two things that I want to talk about. Trust and psychological safety. So one challenge right now is, yes, we are all remote and we don't see the people um, in real life and we are definitely missing out on all those nonverbal communication pieces that we would, that we would feel and see um, if we were in the same room. As a remote PM, um, so I've been a remote PM for quite some time, um, actually uh, for like two and a half years now, um, the last two and a half years, plus a, in a different setup in a different company as well. Um, I can tell you, yes, it's more difficult to, to build trust and psychological safety in a, in a remote setup. It's not impossible. Um, it has its challenges and it has like some, yeah, differences. Um, things are easier when you see people, when you feel them and when you can go over, talk to them, you know, and all those little things that happen in your, in your day to day interactions. You don't have that. That makes it more important that on the one hand, you are more proactive and you proactively during the retrospective, try to engage um, your team members. But don't try to force them to anything. Things will happen that you, you, you didn't, you didn't um, expect. Things like, you know, what if the audio quality of one team member's microphone is really bad? So how do you make sure that this person gets heard? You have to find a way for it. Or what if the band, we have bandwidth issues or your team members have bandwidth issues and some of them need to turn their camera off so that it kind of works for them. It's not an untypical situation in Germany, for example. Or what if people simply don't want to turn their camera on? I have this situation. You cannot force them to do that. You know, and you shouldn't. If I say you need to build trust, then this is part of it. Don't force people to do things that they feel uncomfortable with. Otherwise, you will do the exact opposite. You will hurt trust. They won't feel safe. They will, be, they, they will feel be forced to do things. And that's not a good feeling. So be prepared for unexpected things 
and ham deal with it, handle it in a way that you surprise yourself how flexible you are. That's one thing. And the, the other thing about trust and psychological safety is, look, now I'm turning again to product managers um, specifically, if you want it or not, if you feel it or not, in practice, in, in, real, in real life, in reality, the, the tasks and duties of your role put you in some kind of a leadership position. The team will see you as kind of a leader if you are or not, if you feel like that or not, and they will probably not even, or not all of them will even admit that they see you kind of like a leader. But that's your role somehow. You know, you're, you're setting priorities. You, you are telling the team what to work on next, which problem to fix next, or which problem to work on next, and this kind of things and many other things. And, and if you feel it or not, you are kind of in that situation. So it's your responsibility to make sure that the team feels safe enough to try things out, safe enough to be themselves, to speak up openly and honestly about their thoughts, to trust each other, to trust you, and basically to engage and be proactive themselves, feel ownership and even take risks without fearing any punishment. It's not a thing that you can fix within um, a couple of weeks if you think that you don't have this psychological safe environment in your team yet, or if you think that your team doesn't feel it yet, you cannot fix it in, within, within a couple of weeks, especially not in this um, uh, remote environment. It takes longer in a remote environment than an on-site uh, environment. But in general, it's going to take its time, and that's okay. Take the time. But in the end, that's the goal, right? So only a team that feels safe will also be very active and engage in day-to-day -day work. It's not only about the retrospective. It's completely also about the day-to-day -day work. And therefore, I want to read out um, the mantra, the mindset that I want you to put your team on. And also, when you start out with retrospectives especially, read it out, say it, believe in it at the beginning of every retrospective. So the mindset is the following. We and the team, we understand and believe that everyone does and did the best job they could, given what they knew at the time, their skills and abilities, the resources available and the situation at hand. You see where this goes? I mean, it's about really trusting each other. It's about trusting and believing that everybody really did the best they could at that time with all the things that they had in the situation at hand. Repeat that at the beginning of every retrospective and put this as your goal for your team to make your team grow in this psychological safe mindset. That's all about um, retrospectives and how they can help you um, in changing in what environments to improve um, the workflows that you're working in, actually in any kind of situation, in any kind of department and in any kind of way of, of working about psychological safety and about your role as product manager in this context. If you have any input on this, if you, have, if you want to talk about uh, retrospectives, have feedback about it, um, if you want to talk about psychological safety, um, about remote product management or product leadership, um, remote collaboration in general, or you know, just want to chat and say hi, um, reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to hear from you, and I'm also happy to hear um, your feedback and your input on this topic. So stay healthy, stay safe, stay sane, and stay curious. <laughs>